Thank you for tuning in to an extended version of Jeremy Saline's testimony. We were very blessed the other evening through our program, which was short for a 20-minute interview prior to the main message of the evening. But on the extended versions of these testimonies, we want to help give you a, a broader view of what someone's life has been like. And many people can identify with the, the deeper, more far-reaching stories and I'm very blessed again to be able to be here and have time with Jeremy. And I pray that you will uh, greatly benefit from this testimony and be blessed. So Jeremy, welcome again, and um, I'm anxious to talk to you um, about your life. Um, you know, for most people, you, I think you probably look like you're about 30 years old, but you have a more complete uh, story than that. You have a number of years of, of history and experience in your life, and I'm anxious to get to know uh, more in depth about your experience if you'll, if you'll just go to the beginning of your life and, and maybe take us uh, down that road for a little bit, it would be helpful to the listeners. Okay. Well, I was, um, I was raised in Coquille, Oregon. Um, I was raised in an Adventist family. We went to our local Adventist church. Um, as a kid, I was very, very religious. People that knew me thought that I would probably grow up to become a pastor. Mm. Um, I spent a lot of time reading the Bible, and at night, um, after my parents thought I was in bed, I would be in bed praying for them and for my for my friends and family. That was a thing that I often did late into the night. And that was, how old were you when that was going on? Eight, nine, ten. Okay. Um, and I grew up in the, you know, the, the 80s and the early 90s. Um, at the height of the HIV AIDS epidemic. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of hatred and anger directed towards the LGBT mm -hmm. plus community. And so at eight, eight, eight and nine years old, did you, did you have any handle on the LGBT community at all? Not really, no. Okay. I, I grew up in a very sheltered environment. All um, right. So it was very church oriented. I went to private school. Very protected. School. Yeah. Uh, you went to Adventist schools? Yeah. All right. And, and things begin to shift uh, from your concentration on Christ and the church. I'm, sh I'm guessing probably about the time that you come into puberty, um, there's a wake up there of some sort yeah. or, or an outside influence that hits you. What is that? Yes, it's, well, it was a very clever trap that the enemy set for me. He had surrounded me by people who my, not so much my family. My family were always very, very caring, but the, the people around me had been very um, judgmental towards the LGBT plus community, and especially because of the HIV uh, epidemic, there was a lot of hatred. And so I, I came to be convinced that that was just the worst thing anyone could be. And so... So personally, I just want to interject here. Before you become aware of the attitudes towards the LGBT community, I want to focus a little bit on what your experience is like that is beginning to draw you into any kind of conceptualization about what, what LGBT is or your personal feelings. Can you share about that? You know, the, the thing of it is, is that I wasn't taught about that. Like, I didn't really even understand what it was that these people were, were doing, really, to, to some extent. I understood that it was something we didn't talk about, and it had something to do with that sexual stuff adults talk about. <laughs> okay. It wasn't really something so, But that you're I, developing somewhere in here same-sex attraction. You know, I... I yeah, I, as I started going through puberty... Um, I, because I guess what I'm trying to get at is that, I, I, you know, because you're, you're addressing right now the attitudes towards the LGBT community, but I'm trying to, what I'm trying to ascertain is 
why, why were you even aware or concerned about that and in relationship to, you know, you're going to church, you're, uh, you're a Christian, and so you're sharing with us about the views towards the LGBT community, but what, what prompts this interest? Well, I think it was pervasive in the culture at the time. Like, there were people on TV talking about it all the time, and, okay. and um, people talking about it in the ah, community. All right, so, so now there is an awareness of, like, here I am, I'm, I'm one of these people they're talking about. I'm a Christian, and here's this LGBT community, and it seems like people don't like them. Right. All right. So now, now we have a basis for which um, you make this observation, but lo and behold, what happens? Well, I, I, not only do I make the observation, but I think the devil hardens us to make judgments about, about people. And so I, I made up my mind that that was a terrible thing. And then I went through puberty. Mm -hmm. And because I was so ignorant of what, um, what that meant, I didn't even at first realize that my same-sex attractions were what people were talking about. Okay, yeah. You're pretty naive I'm about it. I'm just naive about yeah, it. Yeah. And so it wasn't until I had come to, un to experience these attractions and give in as a young, as a young boy um, that that light bulb went on in my head. Was there an experience? Did you, did, did you um, individually experience this by yourself? Or was, did, you, did you begin to have an encounter that began to, to raise your thinking as to, oh, what's happening to my body? I think it was just, as, as I went through puberty, I began to experiment with myself and, and the, the... Did that involve sexual, pornography or...? Not exactly pornography. Um, they used to have those old Sears catalogs that had underwear models and, right. and things like yeah. that. And that's, um, I remember spending a lot of time looking through the okay, catalogs. Sure. Yeah. And so as I began to accept that this was just, this was a new exciting thing, you know, that I, I was developing, um, that light bulb went on and I realized this is what they're talking about. This is what everyone's talking about. I'm one of them. I'm one of them. And it caused a near 180 in my relationship with God because I, I was convinced that God couldn't love you if you were like that, and now suddenly I was like that. How did that affect your, your church experience? So now you're, what, 13 or so, and you're still going to church, so are you still reading the Bible and celebrating that? at the same time, or do you start going, wait a minute, I'm not who I'm supposed to be? Well, yeah, it, it was, it, it made me very ashamed. I was very scared, and I didn't talk to anybody about it for years because I realized, I, I didn't want anyone to know this. Mm -hmm. And so I, I tried and I prayed, and I wanted God to, to save me from it at first, and Mm -hmm. And that didn't happen. You wanted the feelings to go away. Right. And were you still going to Adventist schools? I was, yeah. Um, until my high school years. Um, okay. But through, through that process, I think because I had accepted that God couldn't love me, it was, I mean, it's his love that draws us. It's his love that changes us. So it's, I had pushed away the thing that um, could have affected change. Mm -hmm. um, and, and did you so, confide in anyone? No. Uh, eventually, my freshman year of high school, one night I, I told my mother that I was gay. Was that, that was the first person you talked to? Yeah. Wow, and what was the response from your mom? Um, she said that she had suspected for a while <laughs> uh, yeah. that... Um, Our parents usually know us pretty well. <laughs> yes. Um, that, of course, this is something that she disagreed with, mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. biblically. She took a biblical position, but that she loved me and that that wouldn't change. So <clears throat> I always reflect on the fact that uh, King David says that we were born in shaping in, in iniquity. <clears throat> and the, he seeks to... <clears throat> 
gain access to us from our earliest ages and what he uses in the process of that is our feelings. So I'm beginning to think here that your feelings are becoming very real to you. Tell me how you were processing that in relationship to the church and your relationship with God. Hmm. Well, I... I really had a lot of depression. Um, I came to a point where I, I just, I couldn't take what I perceived as rejection from God, which was actually me moving away from God and accepting a, a false reality, really. Um, and so eventually it came to a point where I couldn't endure that anymore. So I had to just separate myself from church and I went to, I chose to go to public school my sophomore year. Um, and there were still some battles because my, my junior, I went to four different high schools. I went, you uh, went to what? Three, well, three different high schools. Okay. I went, my freshman year, I went to a private Christian academy. Uh, my sophomore year, I went to public school and, and God was still working with me throughout this whole process. And so my, my junior year, I went to Milo Adventist Academy and then my senior year, I went back to the public school. And that's when I kind of severed ties with the church and all together. So you're living at home still? Yes. And you say, I'm not going to church anymore. Yeah. Well, in the meantime, my parents had gotten divorced sometime in my sophomore year. And so public school, I went from Coke Hill to Bandon, where my new stepdad lived. And so that was, he was actually not... A Christian and so it was easier for me to to do that than it would have been I think before mm -hmm. but um, yeah that's my, my senior year in high school is when I basically just severed ties with 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 not religion but with Christianity with Adventism mm -hmm. <clears throat> you're coming into a point of becoming a, a young adult yourself realizing you can make your own decisions um, and that those are going to have to be respected by your parents. Mm -hmm. Did you begin moving in directions that um, began to make that separation more clear? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I had been so close to God and, and everything in my life had been um, religion-centered that it, it didn't even occur to me that I could just not be religious. <laughs> And so I walked through a variety of, of New Age religions. I ended up uh, calling myself a practicing Wiccan for, for five or six years mm -hmm. there. And luckily God kept me out of looking back. I see God keep guiding me through that uh, dangerous thicket because I, I could have easily gotten lost in that religion. But, um, there were a couple of times, and, and, I, and I thank God for a praying mother because I would buy these books on witchcraft, which is what the religion of Wicca is, mm -hmm. and I would bring them and I would read them, and, and I was convinced that this was, the, this was going to help fill that void in my life that was left by God. I, help me out here. So I always want to know from, from people I've always wanted to ask these questions as to, Knowing, knowing Christ and knowing the pureness of Christ and the, the, the well intentions of loving somebody, how, how could you do a 180 and actually invite the devil into your life? Well, you know, I, I literally did come to a point where I said, well, if God doesn't want me, then the devil will. And so mm -hmm. I turned towards that. And, and the devil knows us very well, too. Um, and so he knew that if he had presented me this scary, awful religion, I would have been like, nope, I can't do this either. <laughs> and so what he did was he showed me the nature-loving, kind of hippie-esque side of, of Wicca, where you are, you know, it's just about respecting nature, and there's a goddess that loves you, and, and all this kind of stuff. That's the part of Wicca that I went into. It wasn't really this hardcore, like scary devil worship it was it was a benevolent nature religion you know i can't imagine that possibly pot entered the picture all <laughs> of a sudden it, well weirdly i um i didn't really do many drugs until later in life i started mm -hmm. doing drugs later but 
but I was just so desperate to fill that void that God used to fill that I was looking for anything to fill it, and so that's what I filled it with. And luckily I had, you know, I, I was always kind of a natural skeptic as I grew up um, because of, I think because of that hurt that I felt from my perceived rejection by God that any, anything else had a certain level of skepticism on it. And so I was trying to purposely build my faith in this new religion. And my mom, I came home from school one day and she was sitting there with a couple of these books on witchcraft. And she set me down and she said, you know, I, at first I was really worried that you were getting into some scary stuff. And she said, she kind of leafed through the book and she said, but I'm not so sure I'm worried anymore. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, look at, look at these spells. She said, you, you sit in nature with your back against a tree and imagine its energy flowing into you, and then you're restored. She said, Jeremy, that's how sitting down and resting works. <laughs> you just sit and rest. Of course you would be re restored. <laughs> and, and, it, and I said, oh, yeah, well, you, know, you believe in talking snakes. And I was out the door and, and angry. And, and but it... But that moment shattered this, this fledgling faith I had been building in this religion. And so for many years after that, I said I was a practicing Wiccan, but I didn't really believe it. Because she was right. I realized sitting with your back against a tree will make you feel <laughs> rested. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't magic. This is just how things work. Right. And so that was pretty much the defining moment that broke my faith in the occult, which is mm. a really lucky thing that I didn't go further into that, um, that danger. Typically, when uh, somebody uh, envelops uh, same-sex attraction and <clears throat> becomes a little familiar with what's out there, they want to equate themselves <clears throat> with uh, people from, from the culture that end up uh, drawing them into nightclubs and into drugs and into all kinds of things that celebrate a, a different culture than the one that you were conditionally growing up in. But that didn't happen so much for you. Um, tell me, did you, did you have a first encounter? Did this be, was this the glue that began to seal your new identity in LGBT culture? How, how did you come out? Um, you know, I, I actually didn't even have a sexual encounter with another man until I was 21, somewhere in there. Um, I but I was a pretty militant gay rights activist prior to that. In that, in that, I called myself gay, I identified as gay, I told everyone around me that this is how I was born, and, and et cetera, et cetera. But I lived in a really rural town, in a really area where people just didn't come out. They, you know, they stayed in the closet, and, and eventually I, I did have an encounter with a man that was just kind of an anonymous hookup sort mm -hmm. of encounter. And, and that was, I remember being very traumatized by that. <laughs> like, that's not, I had always been a very romantic person. Like, I imagined things to be romantic, and that was not at all what that encounter was like. It was more of a carnal approach. Right. <clears throat> um, and so it was a while before I did that again. And eventually I did, I, you know, you learn how to find people in a small town and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and how to hide it. But my issue was, was I was, it never occurred to me to hide. Like I never lied about who I thought I was. Mm -hmm. And so. So you basically become somewhat of an ambassador for the LGBT culture without even had, having the real experience of it. That's right. Defensive because uh, based on how you felt and how you saw the church treating the LGBT plus community, Adventists not being any less guilty than any other denomination. Um, and I might say here that even today I see this as a difference between ignorance and willful blindness. And today there's, you know, that's why I'm in the ministry that I'm in and coming out ministries as well in helping to educate 
the church um, how to love without compromise, and at the same time calling somebody who identifies as LGBT to come into uh, the presence of God and, and living in a life of surrender and self-denial. But these two worlds have collided, which makes one, you know, not deal so well with the other, communicate very well with the other. And that, I think, is, is the super glue for keeping somebody on the outside of the church. Was, was that your experience? That, that was exactly my experience. I, you know, the devil, this is the devil's master plan. Um, he uses um, LGBTQ confusion, confusion to, and, and LGBT plus people to anger Christians, and then he, Christians are... Yeah angry and sometimes bigoted back and, and it becomes and and that's sin on both sides that's yes. that's the devil pulling people away from Christ on both yeah. sides using those issues to separate us and so yeah I, I think the devil made sure I encountered a lot of people that told me things like you're going to burn in hell for who you are and you deserve that That's that was one of the things that um hardened my heart against Christianity and whole and in God and against God was having these people misrepresent his character to me. Yeah. Did you continue to live on the Oregon coast or did you branch out into any cities or I, I eventually moved to Eugene uh -huh. um, and lived there for a while and became much more sexually active there. It was a much bigger town. Uh -huh. um, and then I eventually moved to Portland where and I had a couple of, you know, longer term relationships in between there and then I moved to Portland and um, that's where I met the last partner I lived with and we were together about seven or eight years. What did you look for in, in meeting someone of the same gender? Uh, did you see it from the standpoint, <clears throat> I mean this is before a gay marriage, did you, did you think uh, I'll, I'll meet someone and I'll live happily ever after? What were your goals in uh, securing a relationship with someone. When you um, when you have the like you get used to the hookup culture, and so that's just kind of what you settle with. You think that maybe that's not for me, and and I think for me that was a good thing because had I been settled and had I been happy, I think it would have been harder for God to reach me. So you went through a couple of, of rather short-term relationships. Now you're in something that's a longer-term relationship. Were you in love? Yeah, at first. Um, I want to be careful in case uh, anyone watches this, but um, it, it was, we were very close at first. Mm -hmm. um, and then just kind of over time, you grow apart. <laughs> Um, we had different interests and different priorities, I think. And so eventually we broke up, but we were still friendly with one another. I, I continued to live there at the house where he was, where he, that he was buying um, uh, for a couple of years after that. After we, well, about a year after we broke up. In Eugene up. or on the coast? Portland. Oh, in Portland, okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> one summer night, you're out underneath the stars, and by this time, you have decided that God really doesn't exist. Right. I, um, as I had transitioned out of the occult into a kind of a more skeptical worldview, I, um, you know, 9-11 happened, and there was the rise of the new atheist movement, authors like Sam Harris mm. and Richard Dawkins and those guys, and I read all their books and at first I was, I was, you know, I read uh, Sam Harris's letter to a Christian nation. And I thought, yeah, Sam, you tell those Christians. And then I realized, you know, his arguments kind of apply to all religious beliefs. And, and, and I, as I applied them to mine, I began to think of my past religious experiences as just a kid with an overactive imagination. And, and my image of God was so warped um, that it was easy to convince myself he wasn't real. And so I just discarded the idea of God and religion and started walking down the path of atheism and, and became a rather militant atheist. And not just an atheist, but an anti-theist, which is a whole new category that, that um, 
it's not, it's not just unbelief, it's you can't believe either, and I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> so um, I was that, that guy you encounter online that will just not leave you alone about your beliefs. That's, that was me. <laughs> and, um, and so I came to a point that, that one night, just sitting out on the, the back patio of the house where I was living, um, where I just... I wasn't happy. I was, I was uh, questioning everything, and I had this experience. I'm actually going to back up one night because there was a two-night thing there, and I don't normally talk about the first night. Mm -hmm. um, the first night I was out there, and I was, I was contemplating what I believed and what everyone else believed, and I thought, if God was what I said he was. He was, I claimed he was a tyrant and, and you know, eternal hell is awful and all of these things. Mm -hmm. If God was what I thought he was and he was real, would I have the courage to not worship him? And it shook me to the core of my being that I couldn't answer that question. Mm -hmm. Like if the alternative really was burning forever and and God really was as awful as I thought, would I still have the moral courage to be tortured forever pointlessly to oppose him? <laughs> and I couldn't answer that question. And it shook me all the way down to where I thought was the core of my identity. And so the next night, as I was contemplating this and trying to think, you know, what my worldview is, Looking back, I think it was the Holy Spirit that kind of impressed upon me the reality of the naturalistic worldview. And as I listed the things, evolution, and we're, we're just animals and, and, and whatnot, I began to understand on a soul deep level what those things mean, the implications of those things, that we're alone and, we're, and our cause is hopeless and none of this makes any sense. And I, I, I flinched away from that so strongly that I nearly fell off my chair. And when I did, there was a presence there that just caught me. Wow. Wow. And it wasn't, I want to clarify, it wasn't a visible presence. It was just, but it was a physical presence. I, I was caught. And love like I had never felt, mm. but that reminded me of what I what I remember it being a child, being in bed those late nights, that presence I felt then, yeah. love like, like that flowed through me and it scared me because here I am, this big you know, militant atheist skeptic and, and this is not <laughs> normal, right? <clears throat> and so, and I knew, I knew who it was. There was no doubt in my mind that it was Jesus. So suddenly your heart is open to the influence of God and, you're, and you, you don't even want to recognize that that's what's happening. Right. Meanwhile, you have a mother who's been praying all along, right? That's right. It's the, I always say, you know, those prayers come and get you. They do come and get you, thankfully. Thankfully. And so I pushed God away. And I sat there. Because, and because he's a gentleman, he will never force himself on right. us. He allowed me to be there alone. And I was there in the darkness, depressed and scared. And I had this, this list of beliefs that I thought I believed kind of just hanging over my head. And I, I berated myself for, for being a coward and needing and wanting that love and that acceptance that I had just felt. And as I tried to make myself accept the atheistic worldview, I was overcome with extreme anxiety and fear and pain, like, like I was being torn away from something. So I'm curious, can your partner not wonder what it is that's going, why are you having this demeanor on this particular evening? I am, um, I, I worked in retail management, so I was up way later than everybody else was asleep. <laughs> um, so I, I uh, um, was basically alone for most of the night. You could kind of hide it. Yes, okay. yes. 
Um, but it's working on your mind. It's working on and my mind. And that residual effect does bleed into our relationships. Yeah, yeah it's, um, yeah, I'll talk about that as, uh, uh, a little bit later. Um, but so I, that experience, that pain, that fear scared me so badly that I just threw myself back into Jesus' arms and he caught mm -hmm. me again mm -hmm. and he held me close. And, Amen. and that pain, he soothed that pain in my mind and that fear. Um, and as I was laying there with my head on his chest, I said to him, I'm scared and, and I'm confused and I don't understand what's happening. And he said to me, I just wanted to come to remind you that you are loved. Mm. And I again said to him, I'm scared and I'm confused and I don't understand. And he said, I know, and there's something that we have to talk about. And this panicked me because I knew what we had to talk about. <laughs> and so I, you know, I, I brought up various arguments that I used against him, like his character at before, um, <clears throat> very anti-biblical arguments that I'd used in atheist forums and, and uh, trying to distract him from, much like the woman at the well, trying to distract from what we needed to talk about with religious controversies. <laughs> um, a, ba a battle of the mind is taking place. Mind. And so finally he said to me, Jeremy, do you know why it is you're so afraid of what I have to tell you? And I said, no, even though I <laughs> did know. <laughs> He said, it's because you think it makes you unlovable in my eyes. Mm -hmm. And he said, that is a filthy lie. It's filthy. It is not true. You are already loved. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter yeah. of you being able to be loved in the future. I already love you. I have always loved you. <laughs> he had purposed you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He said, will you just trust me? And I said, yes. And he laughed this, this laugh of pure joy, like that I would finally trust him. <laughs> Made him so happy. And he said, you know what we have to talk about. You know that being gay isn't what I intended, that homosexual acts are a sin, mm. that nothing in this world is as I intended it, Everyone is broken and everyone has fallen. And so being gay or engaging in these acts does make you a sinner, but being a sinner hardly makes you special. Uh -huh. and, and it was impressed upon me that he indeed does regard these, these acts as a sin, but that he loves me and that he wanted me to, to come and find out who I was with him. So are you contemplating the implications of what this is going to do with your, with your flesh versus the love and the warmth and the truth and everything that Jesus plans and desires for you just now smacking up against each other? It was, it was a battle. Even there, even with him, and, and I could feel his love. I could feel what he is and how much he loves me. It was like I had, the previous night, I had needed to understand the false image of God so that the next night he could present me with the true image of God. That I couldn't even answer the question the night before, but why would I not want to answer the question this night Would I serve this, this God that loves me so much? So you have this initial night. You, you put these feelings aside and go about your daily business. And I'm guessing that, that you, you, took, you came out again the second night to have an encounter with God. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's so personal yeah. and one-on-one, -on -one. yeah. And so I, I, all of this, because he, you know, God, he can't compromise, but he loves us and he invites us to come into relationship with him. And so I was struggling there, even with him there. Like my whole life, I had fought against what he was saying. Yeah. You know, everything in my life had been 
about rebelling against this idea. And so, I had, a few days prior to, to that, I had been arguing with a, fr a friend of mine, one of the few religious friends left, and he had said to me, finally he had just said, you know, Jeremy, have you ever considered that we're just too broken to really know the truth or figure it out on our own? Mm -hmm. and, and so as I was sitting there, that thought popped into my mind, and I thought, you know what, I will just trust this God that clearly loves me so much. I'll just trust that what he says is true, and I'll start there. Mm -hmm. And so he told me to move back to my to my family, to my mom, um, to move out of Portland where there are lots of bad influences, and I was... Uh, so you must have had some kind of an encounter with your partner to describe what's going on. Yeah. I, How uh, was that received? Well, we, um, we weren't together, so it wasn't quite as... Um, confrontational. But you were, you were living together, we were, but you weren't together. We weren't a couple, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, the very next Saturday, I got up and went to church. Praise and the Lord. Is, and that is not um, mm -hmm. something he would have expected of me, obviously. Yeah. Um, well, I got up and I drove past church and I sat in the parking lot and then I went to the 7-Eleven next door and I smoked at the time, so I chain smoked and glared at the church, but, <laughs> but I was near a church the God next Saturday. God meets us where we are, Jeremy. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, and so when I got back, I was still in a suit and he said, where did you go? <laughs> and I said, well, I went to church. And he said, okay, <laughs> and then we just didn't talk about it for a while, and, and, a, and a while later, he, uh, several weeks actually, he said to me, so what, does, what church is this? What church do they believe? Are you attending or, or, or thinking about attending? And I said, well, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and he said, oh, I've never looked into what they believe, and that's literally the last time we talked about it. Mm. Uh, he wasn't very open at all. Mm -hmm. He was he was an atheist as well, not so much a militant one. He just didn't believe and didn't see any reason to. And so there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity to talk about it. Um, but as I was getting ready to move, I was again sitting out I, on the back porch and I was talking to my mom and she was telling me about this sermon that a, that a, that a pastor had preached had talked about Abraham Lincoln, he had freed the slaves, but it took a while for everyone to know that the slaves were free, right? So even after the, the, the proclamation, there were people who didn't know they were free. And she, she was like, the pastor was likening this to Jesus. Jesus has freed us, but there were many of us in slavery and bondage who didn't know we were free. Mm -hmm. And I looked down at the cigarette that I was smoking and I thought, you know, my father's freed me from this addiction if I just acknowledge it. And I finished that cigarette, <laughs> and I started up another one, and I said goodbye to my mother, and I was sitting there, and I thought, I should put this out. I should just be done with this. And so I did. I put it out. I, I took my pack of cigarettes and my lighter, and I put it in a plastic bag and threw it in the garbage. And then about an hour later, I was digging the cigarettes out of the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I lit it up, and I clearly heard a voice say, Jeremy, put that cigarette out. Because <laughs> you're free. <laughs> and, I, and I said, all right, well, I mean, I, that's pretty clear. I put the cigarette out, and I threw it away. And, and that was the last cigarette I ever smoked. Mm -hmm. um, wow. Praise the Lord. It was a struggle. I know you hear sometimes that God takes those addictions away and, and people don't even suffer. Well, I suffered. And, uh, but every time I would get to the breaking point where I'm like, I have to have a cigarette, I would just think to myself, my father's already freed me of this addiction. Mm -hmm. I just have to acknowledge it. And that, that pain of withdrawal, the, the cravings would just evaporate like that. They would just be gone. And, so every t and sometimes I had to repeat that to myself multiple times in a minute. But that's what eventually got me through, and uh, and 
So that conviction, even with that, begins to carry forward as you become more in alignment with the fact that God's word is true and that mm -hmm. he does love and care about you. And now a transformation is beginning to take place. Yeah. And, and wanting to be healthier to honor him. Um, and so I... I put in for a transfer, my job. I was working for Ross Dress for Less, and, uh, and there was one down in Coos Bay in the area. Um, and so I put in a transfer, and God just smoothed away. It was, it was literally 30 days, and they, they put that transfer through. Um, there's no logical reason for that, because I was a manager, and even getting out of that position is difficult if you want to keep working for the company. Mm -hmm. but, but it happened faster than I'd ever seen it happen. Um, and by the end of 30 days, I was, I moved, I packed my stuff. I told my partner, I need to move. Um, I have to move back home. Uh, and so I did. You're then going to church then with your mom. Your mom must be like praising God <laughs> and very elated about the fact that you're back. Yeah. Yes. Um, Yes, uh, she. Um, I called her the next day after after that encounter with God, and she had been very worried about me because I had been very depressed and very. I had had so much anxiety in my life that they had put me on various medications, and, and the medications had messed me up a little bit, and I <clears throat> weaned myself off them, and. So she had been worried that she knew that something was going on, that there was the fight over who who I would serve was becoming more intense. Mm -hmm. um, and so I called her and I was hesitant. I was hesitant to talk about it because I was, I was still struggling with God. And I, and, I, and I told her, you know, I had something weird happen last night. And she got very serious. And, and, I, and I said, yeah, I, and she, she said, are you all right? And I said, well, yeah, it was nothing bad. I just had, had this very long conversation with God. <laughs> and, and she said, what? <laughs> like, fr from me, I was so hostile to religion and, and to God that to even say that, she knew something miraculous must have happened. <laughs> and, and I said, yeah, I, turns out he's real and, <laughs> and he loves us. And she just started crying. I was going to say, I can't imagine the emotions of your mother as you begin to declare to her that you are looking to Jesus. Yeah. It was, uh, she had just gotten out. She was the chairman of a, of a church school board down, down in, in the Coos Bay North Bend area. And she'd just gotten out of a meeting. And so the people there gathered around her and they prayed. <laughs> and it was a very good experience. Uh, that's awesome. It was, it was God's grace is what it was. It was beautiful. You, at this <clears throat> point, then meet a, a pastor by the name of Bryce Bowman. Yes. Tell me about that. Well, I was very nervous because my experience with pastors and religious men in general have not been very good. And so this pastor was new to the, the church the Coquille Church, which is adjacent to North Bend Coos Bay, is in that area. It's the church that I grew up in, and so it's kind of the church that I went back to. Um, but Bryce just welcomed me in. I get, told him my testimony. Um, he was also very excited about it. Uh, he, he studied with me through baptismal classes and then baptized me. And uh, I... I put together a presentation of my testimony and I preached it at the church. And Bryce and Sandy both and their kids, their whole family just kind of embraced me and welcomed me into the church. And that was, God knew exactly where to put me, exactly where I should be to continue my journey with him, with, with people that would welcome me and help me. So they acted <clears throat> like commissioned disciples should act with yes. when you're receiving the prodigal home, right. embracing you, uh, praying God's joy and peace over you and you're flourishing in that environment. You've developed uh, considerably in your walk with God. And a some people today, like myself, uh, not, not everyone, a lot of people don't want to be particularly public about 
where they were and who they are now because you a lot of people will get that scarlet letter put on their head that that's who you always will be but you begin to work within a framework of the church and this is one thing that's important to me is that when somebody comes to Christ it doesn't matter whether you've come out of prostitution drugs uh, homosexuality whatever the case may be is that when God's family is there to receive you, you just start going to work in the family of God where he directs you. And he's directed you in multiple ways. Can you tell me what you're, what you're doing today for Christ? Well, yeah, I think, I think working in the church is one of the most important things that we can do. That's one of the things that I am very grateful Bryce did. He put me immediately to work in the church. Well, good, you can help us with this evangelism series, right? and, and you can help us with uh, uh, the, we do a thing called Remote Adventure Camp, which is a summer one-week summer camp we run for kids um, in the summer down there. That was a little nerve-wracking for me. I, I never had kids. I'd never really been around kids. And I'm like, I don't know about kids. But I found a lot of joy in it, actually working with the children and, and helping them come to know Jesus. And then recently, I... Um, I've started an outreach to the homeless, the homeless ministry that we've been doing. Um, I, I, uh, I did a lot of social committee events, and, and I started working with Bryce as his assistant. The church hired me on, and then um, after Bryce left and we were in between pastors, I, I continued to work for the church kind of as a point man just to help, you know, anything needs that arise. And now that we have a new pastor, that employment has ended. But I'm continuing to work in the homeless ministry and uh, a variety of other places. When someone leaves the LGBT culture for Christ, there is often a stigma that seems to, to get attached to us. Have you experienced any of that? Um, I hesitate to bring this up because it's an extremely difficult topic but I got told when I came back into the church that they were watching me. Mm -hmm. And I said, watching me? And they said, yes, because of the elements of pedophilia. And I said, what? And the pastor said to me, well, aren't all gays pedophiles? What? <laughs> you know, I was like, the, the confusion and the association that people have who haven't delved into ministry towards LGBT people um, have all these incredible misconceptions. And those things have weighed heavy on my heart because it's like I get this idea that people have this preconceived idea about who I am without even getting to know me. I, you seem pretty solid in your, I see you as timid but firm in your approach and you don't look like somebody who plays victim and so just un unpack that for me a little bit you know it's it's funny that you would say that because m many of my negative most negative experiences with religious people growing up and, and and as i fought against religion was this assumption that because you're gay you're going to molest children mm -hmm. it's it's such a false assumption and it's so insulting um Amen. <laughs> i and, and, and it's especially ironic because the people's children would have been safe with me, whereas a lot of times people who prey on children infiltrate churches, yes. and, and mostly uh, uh, heterosexual men are molesting the children. Sure. But, but um, as I came back, that was one of my hesitancies. I was hesitant to start working with this summer camp with children because I didn't want people to think that. Yeah. or think that I was trying to get access to children, or, or to be in a position where if a child did falsely accuse me, people would just believe it. Yeah. And so, but you know, that was not the case with Bryce and Sandy. They were the ones running the mm -hmm. camp. They just said, nope, you're, you're coming to work with us. We're going to work with the children. That's how it's going to be. Um, none of my church family there in Coquille ever treated me that way or said anything yeah. like that. You know, family, uh, family ties are good. Uh, we know that the enemy is in the world. The enemy can do all kinds of things. I think one of the important things for everyone as a church member, uh, especially if we've had negative pasts, uh, is to develop accountability. 
but um, your nephew came with you um, for these couple of weeks that you're here, and I have observed the interactions, and I love watching your, your, your nephew's reaction to the church and the involvement of the church and asking his own questions and, and just being so involved and curious and um, on fire for Jesus that, you know, I just have to say that it's, it's a blessing to have been able to see your interactions and your relationship, you know, with, with a nephew, as well as your interactions with, you know, people who are adults within the church, other church members, and your fascinating um, story today. Um, while you have um, been involved in your church in many different activities, it seems to me that you have also had a vein of compassion still for the LGBT plus community in, you know, I've, I've mentioned several times, I see them as, as being on the outside of the church, just looking and waiting for somebody to truly represent Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we can do that without compromising Jesus, but we can't always be responsible for how the person perceives it because it can be pure, true love, but the person doesn't perceive it as love unless we endorse the behaviors that they're addicted to. Um, but you, you have uh, something within you that wants to minister. Just tell me a little bit how you want to go about doing that. Well, um, I, I would like to maybe back up a little bit. I, I, I kind of left out the part where God had been working on my heart to um, become more knowledgeable and more grounded in, in Christ. And so I went to an evangelism school called Arise, mm -hmm. which is run by the Light Bearers. Um, and while I was there, I had been struggling with same-sex attraction still, and and I and I I had continued to pray about it to see if God would just you know fix me and mm -hmm. flip the switch or whatever it was that needed to be done. And while I was there, especially, I was struggling with, with this concept because I had started to realize that God wasn't going to do that because he wasn't willing to take from me something I wasn't willing to give. Yeah. And so I needed to back up and I needed to get on my knees and I needed to pray, help me want to give up my sin. Help me want to be restored into your image. Mm -hmm. And so as I had progressed forward, even before I went to Arise, I had been practicing within myself to whenever I had these temptations or thoughts, I would immediately just give them to Christ. I would say, nope, I don't want these thoughts. These are yours. And as I, as I did that more and more and more, they came less and less. And because I had been training myself to do this, I... Um, when the devil would tempt me with other things, when I would get angry or, or whatever other sins I was struggling with, that's when those same sex attractions would come again and, and I would immediately just stop. Anytime that I had those thoughts or temptations, I would stop and give them to Christ. And so it became counterproductive for the devil to tempt me in that way because I was immediately on guard whenever those same sex attractions happened. And so they came less and less to the point where I rarely experienced same-sex same attraction at all. And so I went to Arise, and while I was there, I kept praying that God would just take this from me to help, help heal this, whatever it was, this, this spiritual wound, this, this psychological wound, whatever it was. And as I would start to experience attraction to women, I would kind of get a little freaked out. I mean, once you, when, you, when you experience reality one way for almost your whole life, mm -hmm. and then you start to experience it another way, it freaks you out, <laughs> or at least it did me. And, and it's a big surprise. It's a surprise, right. Mm -hmm. And so I, I started to realize why God never went and just fixed it like that, because it I would have been too much for me to handle all at once, yeah. I think. And so... As I was struggling with that, I finally, I had this, this, this fight with God one morning. I went on a walk, it was between classes, and I said, you know, God, I 
am okay with not being same-sex attracted. I'm okay with not having a relationship with men. I will be celibate. I will live my life in honor of you. But I do not want to be a straight man. I don't like straight men. My interactions with straight men have been awful. They have treated me poorly. My, my religious straight men uh, interactions have been bigoted and hateful. My secular straight men friends are are sexist and they are, you know, they cheat on their girlfriends and they, they treat women poorly. I don't want to be anything like that. And so if, and it shames me to say this, but I said, if that is your end goal, if you want me to become a straight man, then I'd just rather burn. Mm. <laughs> so your objective was really to follow Christ. Your objective wasn't to become heterosexual. Right. But now God is doing something, like you said, you kind of get a bit of a surprise in, in, in the healing process. And I want to share with people that, um, you know, sometimes people are like, well, are you cured? Are you healed? But, but actually, that healing is a transformation process that begins from the moment we give our lives to Christ until the day that he changes us within the twinkling of an eye. Right. But along the way, God blesses us with some, sometimes some very incredible things that we weren't expecting. Right. And so you, you begin to see that you are having opposite sex attractions. Yeah. And, and one thing I wanted to say about that moment is I think sometimes, you know, I said I'd rather, I'd rather burn than be that. And I think sometimes we attempt to coerce God into coming to our point of view with threats to ourselves because we know he loves us more than we love ourselves even. And Amen. so, but in that moment, in this moment where I was being so confrontational and so angry and so upset and scared, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit came into my heart and said, you know, you think you know who you are. You think you have it all figured out, but you have no idea who you are. And he said to me, you're not a recovering homosexual. You're not a redeemed gay man. You are what you have always been. You are a child of the Most High God. Amen. You are already a straight man. You don't have to worry about becoming one. That's right. You are a straight man who's been deceived into viewing his life through a particular, yes. the lens of a particular yes. spiritual wound. So it was culture that told you that you were gay, not God. And so that was a hard pill to swallow. Yeah. <laughs> that was... Um, no doubt. That, that was difficult. But ultimately, that's why I'm still here. God doesn't compromise. He doesn't, doesn't change. He tells us the truth. And we can trust him to always tell us the truth. And that's why I'm still here. Amen. Even though it was a hard truth, even though it was something that I still don't completely understand. I still don't. You know, I don't generally experience same-sex attraction. Mm -hmm. But I also don't generally experience attraction to women. And so while God is working with me and patient with me, he has left me in this place where I think my cousin described it best. She recently also came back to God. She was identified as bisexual. And she said, it's not so much that I don't have same-sex attraction anymore. It's that God has taken away from me the propensity to sexually objectify my brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. She said, it's, I recognize that this man or this woman is attractive and well put together, and that's where it stops. There's no sexual objectification. There's no what can I get out of it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a very good description of what I experience. I don't, it's not so much that I don't experience attractions. I'm not romantically interested. It's that my brothers and sisters are my brothers and sisters. And if there's going to be attraction of that, of the sexual nature again, God will lead me to that person. Um, and so, to that woman. And so, we will see where that goes. Sure. But, but I do not, mm -hmm. I do not experience same-sex same -sex attraction anymore. So. Wow, praise the Lord. So, it's a change of focus. Yes. And I think for each and every person um, that, you know, God wants to bring that focus into a laser focus on him and things begin to fall off um, when that happens. Yes. Um, your testimony is, is amazing, and it is um, 
so needed uh, today and helping people recognize that living life in agreement with, with Christ is possible. Um, in our closing um, thoughts here, is there anything that you'd like to say um, to somebody who might be viewing this who is contemplating um, LGB culture versus God and the church? I would love to say that I love you and God loves you and don't ever believe anyone telling you otherwise. Amen. I, I, my goal, I always say my goal is to introduce people to Jesus Christ and encourage them to follow wherever he's leading them, not where culture or people are leading. Follow Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I would like to say to, to viewers that if you want to be uh, in contact with Jeremy, uh, that there's, um, there's been a number on our series of meetings that you're welcome to call. Um, you can also get in touch with uh, the uh, staff at uh, Village Church by going to villagesda.org. Thanks so much. God bless you.